in January, um, Catherine Dawson, who actually has done training with John Maxwell, who does leadership, and I are going to be doing a, just a little small group going through a book, in, uh, Intentional Living, and we're going to use that for some of the things we're going to be doing next year. So if you are someone who feels like you want to be a pioneer who goes through a small group with Catherine and I in January to figure out how we can lead the church into being intentional in the way that we live in 2016, talk to me or talk to Catherine. So praying about what God might be leading you to do today. So advertisement done. Um, <laughs> Um, God, thank you that you, you lead us not with fear but with love. Help us when we are in positions of authority to be the same way. That we don't fear, we don't manipulate, but that we transform the world through love. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there's different ways of being a leader. There's different ways of being a king. Some kings, some leaders, some maybe teachers or coaches... The way that they do their leadership is by crushing the people underneath them. Um, that's one way of, of feeling strong and feeling powerful is by taking all the power away from everybody underneath you. That's one way to be a king. But there's another way to be a king and another way to demonstrate your power, and that is to empower the people who are beneath you, to help them to be fully alive and fully functioning. So which kind of king do you think Jesus is? The one who makes himself look good by crushing us under his feet? Or the kind of king that makes us fully alive to go out and live life in all of its abundance? Which kind of king do you think that Jesus is? Number two. And as if you ever come to church and ask a question, it's always number two. Because <laughs> I'm not any more creative than that. Um, Jesus is the kind of king, and it's interesting that you're even look, looking at the kingdom of God, that Jesus when it says in Revelations, he's not making us to be part of his kingdom. He is building us into his kingdom, which is really an interesting way to look at things. So what is a kingdom if we are to be built into this kingdom? In the Bible, the word basileia, which is translated kingdom, is not really so much the way that a lot of us would think of kingdoms. Because we often would think of kingdoms as being this geographical location or physical location the kingdom of Norway, or the kingdom of North Dakota, or whatever. So you think of that <laughs> geographic location. And that's not really the main uh, definition of the word in the Bible. The main definition of kingdom is more of a verb. It's more of a ruling authority. It's an activity that's happening. So when we look at the kingdom of God, it's not so much a place that God's trying to be in control of, but it's people that God is in relationship with that he is able to accomplish his purposes through. So we are the kingdom of God. We are the place that God seeks to accomplish his purposes in and through. When you look at even the Lord's Prayer when we're praying, it says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's really not even two different petitions that you're praying there. It's basically the same thing in two different ways of saying it. Where does God's kingdom come? God's kingdom comes where his will is done. And we seek to be those people that are the location of God's ruling activity, where God's will can be done in the world. And really, I think that, as I look at the Bible, I see that as what God seeks to do, not just now at the end, but also right from the beginning. God sought to build a kingdom, not so much of a location, but God sought to build his kingdom through a relationship with the people that he chose. So the people of Israel, when they were led out of Egypt, and they were brought to Mount Sinai where Moses would go and receive the law, the, the covenant. In Exodus 19, before Moses goes up the mountain, God has this little conversation with Moses and sort of gives an idea of what's going to be happening. And basically what God is saying is, I'm going to be living in the midst of your community, and this is the way that it's going to work well. And this is what God says, Now therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant... You shall be a treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom, a holy nation. So right from the beginning, God is seeking to develop this group of people who, through their relationship with God, through their experiencing His presence, through living the way that He's designed life to be lived, that they are supposed to be part of showing the world the goodness of God. 
And really part of that whole section of the Old Testament was the laws, the covenant that God gives will cause you to love each other so well and live so well together that the rest of the world will want to have that kind of life that you have. That was the whole idea, that by obeying God's voice and keeping his covenant, that they would live in the way that God wanted them to live and they would show the world God's goodness. But still in the Old Testament, we have those two stipulations. If you obey, if you keep, then that gets you access to the kingdom. But God's going to end up changing that access point because they're not going to obey, they're not going to keep. But in Revelation, and it's interesting, you look through the Bible, that theme comes up several times through the Bible where God gives this in the picture of what he's looking for. That picture that God says, I want to make you into a royal priesthood, a, whole, a kingdom. That's not just in Exodus and in Revelation, but that's a couple of other places in the Bible as well. That that's what God's design is. But in Exodus, the way you access that is by following the covenant so that you can stay in the context of that kingdom. But is that what's going to be God's final plan, that it's only by our obedience and our following the rules that we'll access the kingdom of God? Look at Revelation. Our reading for today says, To him who loved, loves us and freed us from our sins, and who made us to be a kingdom. There is no other stipulations given there. It's not if you obey, and it's not if you behave. It's because he loves us. Because he died for us. He has made us to be the kingdom. And once again, the purposes of being the kingdom of God are so that God can be glorified in the world, in and through us. So, I think a lot of how you live your Christian life base, is based on what kind of king you think Jesus to be. And I think there are people who see Jesus as being that kind of king that you make look good by crushing yourself. Do you know any Christians, maybe you're this way yourself, that the way that I can show that I honor Jesus is by making myself feel worthless. There's definitely, throughout the history of the Christian church, there are people that that's their motivation. If I can be a worm, if I can see myself as completely worthless and just ask God to destroy me and obliterate me, then I can show that I'm a good follower of my king. There, that's one way of looking at Jesus' leadership, but do you think that's consistent with what his kingdom is about? So I hear these songs on the radio of God, there's nothing good in me, I'm completely hopeless, I'm completely worthless, just destroy me, and then be glorified. And I hate those songs, I always turn them off when I hear them on the radios. Because that's not consistent with the kingdom of God. If God's kingdom is about setting people free, if it's about helping people to be fully alive, if it's about filling people with his spirit, what is our main strategy being to, to hope that the complete opposite will happen? What the kingdom of God looks like is God, or Jesus showing us who we are. Jesus showing us what God is up to, showing us that we're loved and freeing us and giving us gifts and filling us with the Spirit and helping us to be fully alive. Irenaeus, who was one of the early church fathers, had a quote that I like to refer to regularly as I look at my own prayer time, and that is, a, a human being fully alive is the glory of God. And when we understand that the way that we are meant to honor our King is not by devaluing ourselves and de devaluing each other. But the way we honor our King is by helping us to see the way that He sees us, to see the way that He values us. When you think of Jesus and the interactions that He had when He was here on earth, you look at His interaction with Matthew the tax collector, and He ended up inviting Matthew to be this person that would have been disregarded because he was a tax collector. He invited Matthew to be part of his team, and in the process, all these other tax collectors all of a sudden felt like they could be loved too. So the way that Jesus interacted with tax collectors made all the tax collectors feel valued. That Jesus, when he met the woman at the well, the woman at the well, they come to a place in the conversation where, go get your husband. And then Jesus says, oh, by the way, I know that you've had five husbands and the guy you're with now you're not married to. And at that point, if I had someone who could see that much through me, I would just shrink and run away in fear and terror. But there's something about the presence of Jesus that how does this woman respond? He's just shared that he knows everything about her, 
And does she feel terrified and hopeless? She feels empowered to the point that this is the person I've been waiting for. That's the kind of presence our king has. The, the kind of presence that even in our most vulnerability and our greatest weakness, it doesn't make us feel hopeless, but it makes us feel alive because his presence does that. So if that's what his kingdom looks like, how does that change the way that we seek to honor our king? That Jesus, when he's talking to um, Pilate as he's being tried there before his crucifixion, um, he's saying, my kingdom's not the kind of kingdom that people in this world would understand. My kingdom, you know what, as a matter of fact, what I came for was to simply to testify to the truth. I'm here to just tell people the truth about who God is, the truth about what God is up to, the truth about what God's purposes are, and those who hear my voice and those who believe what I say are the ones who experience my kingdom. And you, you see that coming up in different places. In John chapter 1, where it talks about those who received him, who believed in his name, what did he do? He gave power to become children of God. So their access point was believing that what he said about God, what he said about us, is true. So other places he's going to say in John chapter 8, if you continue in my word, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. So there's something about his kingship is leading people into the truth. It's leading people to see God for who God is. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He's leading people to see themselves for who they are. I don't call you servants, I call you friends. He's leading them to see the truth about what God's purposes are. So that when you look in the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit comes upon people, the Holy Spirit doesn't come upon people in the book of Acts and say, oh, they're sinful and they all get burned up to a crisp. But the Holy Spirit comes upon people, normal everyday people, rich and poor, slave and free, and what does the Spirit do? He helps them to not go home and feel, oh, I'm awful, I better try to fix myself, but gives them courage and boldness, um, helps them to dream dreams and have visions and see possibilities and be optimistic. So, as I think about what honors Jesus, is honoring Jesus belittling myself? No. Honoring Jesus is trying to actually believe that he loves me as much as he does. Honoring Jesus is not being afraid, but honoring Jesus is taking risks. It's going out and, and just loving people and discovering the gifts that I have. Because he didn't come to kill and steal and destroy. Sometimes we have Christian churches who basically the end result of their ministry is killing, stealing, and destroying, rather than giving people life in all of its abundance. As I think about my own kids, about the way that I provide leadership in my family, or maybe you think about coaches you've had or teachers you've had, there are some who feel like the way that I'm going to maintain my authority is by keeping you frightened and submissive. That's not the way that God is. When I look at my own kids, I think the way that they would honor me would be by going and taking risks, would be by going and having dreams and having visions and trying things out and living life in all of its fullness. Even if it meant that they might make decisions that I wouldn't make myself, but it, what's, it's setting them free to live life fully. So why do we think any differently of our King Jesus? Why would we think that Jesus would be glorified by us being frightened and timid and worried and, and not taking risks? The way that we glorify our King is to show the world the freedom that he paid for, the life that he gives us, the gifts that he's poured into us, the love that we share with each other. And that is the glory of God, a human being fully alive. May you be fully alive and in the process show the world what your king is like. Amen.